Hi, everybody. Welcome to Zooming Out, which has been a really fun global series. We have a few people still entering, but I'm so pleased to be here with Lisa Roberts, class of 1986. It's fun to uh, be able to spend a little bit of time with you virtually. I'm excited about that. And uh, welcome. Thank you very much, Miel, for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Very Great. Much so. We've, we've gone around the world. We've had a few people in France, so this will be fun. I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit about Lyon. Am I saying that well? Lyon? Yes, I think so. I say it. Okay. You're wrong, but... So um, again, we have Lisa Roberts, class of 1986. I'm going to give you a little bit of background. Lisa has a long career, so um, Listen in with me as I give you a little bit of background about how she got to where she is today. Um, she has over 30 years experience as a state and federal prosecutor, spe specializing since 2008 in international and comparative criminal law. She's handled more than 1,000, wow, extradition and mutual legal assistance requests made by the US and foreign authorities and has assisted in the return of hundreds of fugitives to face justice and obtain essential evidence for the US and foreign prosecutors. She began her career in 1989 as an assistant district attorney with the Kings County, which is in Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, where she conducted over 25 felony trials specializing in sex crimes, domestic violence, and child sexual abuse. All hard things, Lisa. In 1996, Lisa spent a year as a visiting fellow senior attorney at the National District Attorneys Association American Prosecutors Research Institute. This was for the prosecution of child abuse. It's in Virginia where she worked with fellow practitioners to develop a program called Child Proof, an advanced trial advocacy course for child abuse prosecutors. The week-long practice trial training course ran for over 17 years and provided hundreds and hundreds of practitioners with skills that they were then able to take into the courtroom. In 97, Lisa joined the US Department of Justice Child Exploitation and Obscenity Section where she worked with federal prosecutors from around the country on emerging issues related to the use of the internet for child exploitation offenses. In 1998, she left DC for a three month detail to the US Attorney's Office in Phoenix, Arizona to prosecute child pornography cases and violations of child sexual abuse statutes that had occurred on Indian reservations in Arizona. She enjoyed her work and living in Arizona and following her detail, she took a position as the Assistant US Attorney remaining in Arizona for another eight years. She worked on immigration cases, asset forfeiture matters, and served as acting chief for the asset forfeiture section, where she assisted in the seizure and forfeiture of millions of dollars of assets, representing the proceeds of drug trafficking, fraud, and money laundering. In 08, Lisa returned to Washington and joined the US Department of Justice Office of International Affairs, which acts as the central authority for the United States in gathering evidence for criminal investigations and prosecutions worldwide. By working with domestic partners, foreign counterparts to facilitate cooperation to enforce the law, advance public safety and achieve justice. This is amazing work, Lisa. She served as acting associate director for the Canada and English speaking Caribbean team and has focused on extradition mutual legal assistance, policy, and multilateral matters involving numerous countries, including Colombia, Ireland, East and West Africa, Germany, and Switzerland. In May of 2021, so quite recently, Lisa began a three-year second month at Interpol, the International Criminal Police Organization in Lyon, France, where she oversees a team of attorneys who work with internal police units to facilitate worldwide police cooperation and crime control among the organization's 194 member countries. She's been honored to receive DOJ's award for distinguished service and for supporting the national security mission. Wow, congratulations on all of that, Lisa. Um, Thank you. Very proud of what you've achieved and accomplished. And I can't wait to dive into that in a multitude of ways. But first up, we are going to have a slideshow and kind of look at where you've been living for a few months. 
and hear a little bit about your experiences there. So tell me about this one. Looks like so, work. Um, this, is, this is the um, Interpol building, and this is my first day of work at Interpol. And uh, I, um, I was staying in, you know, a hotel for a, uh, you know, until I found an apartment. And so first I should say that 40 years ago when I was an undergrad, at UMass and Amherst, I wrote a letter to Interpol and asked how I could come work there. Wow. And they wrote me back and they said that you needed to be in law enforcement and you were seconded there. And so I kind of put that aside. And, but also at the same time, I wrote to the New York City Police Department because I wanted to be an undercover uh, detective in Times Square. And so that was all kind of during the, what, in the knowing I wanted to do criminal justice and but what. So anyway, I put the letter aside and then I went on to uh, finish, you know, finish up at Northeastern undergrad and, and take some time off and then go to law school and um, kind of forgot about Interpol. And then when I was at the Office of International Affairs, like a couple of my colleagues were working at Interpol and I realized that they did use lawyers there. And so this opportunity came up um, where they were, the U.S. was willing to second someone to Interpol and uh, so I put my name in the, hat, in the ring and uh, so then selected for the three year secondment and couldn't believe it, honestly, could not believe it. And it really, it was like a full circle thing because, you know, I was kind of getting ready to think about retiring and, and then this came up and I felt like totally, you know, I could not pass up the opportunity and very lucky because, you know, I, I'm seconded from the Department of Justice, so the Department of Justice Comes me here, pays you know my salary and helps with the move and all of that. So it's it's a very good, it's a nice situation and uh, definitely an opportunity that I could not pass up. And so this was my first morning walking to Interpol, where it's you walk through this beautiful park, head door, and um, the entrance to get into security is on a dirt path with a bike, uh, you know, bike share right there. And, that was the main entrance and uh anyway this is my first day wow so explain just for a second what seconded means oh seconded is like a detail where you are um you are still a part of your home base which for me is the department of justice but while i am at interpol i am not a, so i am not doing work for the department of justice in fact when people are seconded to Interpol, they have to sign a letter of um, loyalty to Interpol, basically saying that you will represent the interests of Interpol rather than, you know, some people that are on detail, they are, if you're on detail, you're part of the office that you came from and you represent that office. But when you're seconded, you are I'm a representative of Interpol rather than the Department of Justice, even though they are supporting me. And the headquarters is in Lyon, or is it all over Europe, Interpol? So the headquarters, the home headquarters for Lyon, up for Interpol, which is the International Criminal Police Organization, is in Lyon, and uh, it's made up of 194 member countries. They do have some other offices in Singapore, where they have their cyber section, and I think they have an office in Beijing. Um, we have representation at the UN and at Europol. And I think a few other offices, but this is the home, the home office. That's wonderful. And you put it out there as an undergrad and here you are. It's just amazing. All right. Yeah. Let's look at the next slide. Ooh. So this is the view from my apartment and uh, it's looking out to the Rhone River, which is just across the street. And uh, it's, I love the view and I, I took the picture because when we got the apartment, which is very, it's, when I moved here, people said it's very hard to find an apartment here. And um, I looked at a number of apartments and one of the things about Lyon, and I don't know if it's about all of France, is that a lot of people, when they move, they take their kitchens with them. So they take, you know, the cabinets and really? stove and refrigerators. So it's, it's kind of the norm to find an apartment without a kitchen. And so, one of the criteria I gave to the um, agency that was helping me was, you know, I, I need to have a kitchen. And, um, 
and uh, refrigerator and all of that. So anyway, this apartment is was totally renovated, but in a very old French building and with, uh, you know, big doors that open and parquet floors and it opens up onto this view of the road, which uh, if you walk across the street, there's a beautiful path and people are cycling and walking and you just walk along the river to the, there's barges on the river and then, um, and bars and restaurants and uh, Lovely. Uh, market. So that's the view from my apartment. So this is the uh, stairway that's a big long stairway in a neighborhood called Clarus, which is just across the river from me. And so when I lived in DC, you know, as a form of exercise, I used to love to run up and down the stairs either at Lincoln Memorial or behind Lincoln. And oh, you're like Rocky. Totally, <laughs> yeah, totally like Rocky. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, it was really important to me when I got here to find some way to get some exercise in that was more than walking. And so, Prarus, this neighborhood, very old neighborhood, and just loads of different winding stairways up to it. And so this is one of the stairways that's about a 10 minute walk from my apartment. And so when I found it, I was so happy. And so that's where I will often go and, you know, put my headset on and listen to music at 50s and, you know, just go run up and down the stairs. And, you know, often when I'm coming down, I, you know, the view is beautiful, it looks over to the Rhone. And uh, so that's it. It's a stairway. And it's neighborhood called Crowroof, which is a really cool neighborhood here. Wonderful. This is Beautiful. what they call the Hotel de Ville, which is the, the town hall for Lyon. And it's also just a short walking distance from my apartment and beautiful square with lots of cafes and restaurants on it. And when I first got here and walked Across and then came upon the square. I think it was, you know, one of the many times that I felt like, wow, I'm, I'm in Europe. It feels very European and, you know, surrounded by very old buildings and in this building. And this square actually on between December 8th and 11th is kind of home to a very big celebration, which they have here, which they haven't had in a couple of years because of COVID. It's called the Fête de Lumine, and it's Supposedly, just this phenomenal uh, light show goes on all over the city, and this is kind of the home base for it. But this was, yeah, I was just walking home one night from running out to a store, and uh, just so beautiful. So it really, it really is. Yeah. This is just another side view of the Hotel de Ville. Another, this is an old, uh, the Museum of Modern uh, of uh, Fine Art. Also along the hotel square. This is uh, Bastille Day. So Bastille Day is the holiday here and celebrated with lots of fireworks in the evening. And this is a view across the Rhone, and you can't really see it in the in the picture, but there's a really really old uh, church called the Bouvier, and it's way up on a hill, and it just looks kind of uh, Wizard of oz -ish, and it's lit up at night and it's really beautiful. And so the fireworks go off around the CVA. So this was um, that's my first Bastille Day and they were well, fireworks. It's July 14th. When is it? I think it is July 14th. 14th. Yeah, I think you're right. But I'm not totally sure. <laughs> so this is my wine cave, which was another really big surprise when I got here and rented the apartment, that wow. I have a wine cave. Well, it's not really a wine cave, but most people use it for wine, which I do, and or did. And um, so this is my neighbor, Jean-Pierre, and uh, I've become friendly with him and his wife, Danielle. And this has been really like a very, it's really added so far to my stay here because they are so lovely, and they speak mostly French, and I speak pretty much all English. <laughs> and so, yes, we have these lengthy conversations. And the first night that I went over to visit them, I was there for an hour and a half. And 
sitting there talking and really didn't really know what the story was about and trying to come home and have a glass of wine, but didn't want to be rude and trying to figure out where are we in the story? Are we in the middle or the end? <laughs> so finally, I said, you know, it's just who's a parquet and please. And, um, but they had become great friends. And so Interpol, when I first arrived, uh, they sent around an email where you could order um, wine from this winery, Chapoutier, for 30% discount. Wow. Which, of course, is never received at DOJ. Oh. And so I took advantage of it, and I ordered two cases of wine, and they delivered them. So Jean-Pierre was helping me um, put the wine in the cave and giving me advice on how to store it. And if you're going to drink it that night, never go from cave to table. You know, you must bring it up and let it breathe for a bit. So they've become great neighbors. And then uh, the picture on the left, which is the wine case empty, does not indicate that I drank all the wine in the next few months. Rather, someone broke into my wine case and stole my wine. What? So, yes. So, I, I, despite that, that is a crime. I feel like it's a very French crime, and I can't be too upset about it. So, I went down to proudly show my older brother that I had a wine case, and the door wouldn't open, and then I pulled it open, and the wine, were, there were five bottles left. So, I reported it to Jean-Pierre, who had the suspect, and then we began an investigation, and we do have a suspect, and I, oh. Uh, oh my. I reported it to the And anyway, um, apparently it's a common crime, along with theft of bicycles, are, are uh, two common crimes here. So so anyway, that's... Can you put Interpol well, on it? <laughs> yes. Now, Miel, you'll get to that. Miel, uh, Interpol is not conduct investigation, <laughs> which I'll get to. But um, anyway, so that is the um, All you know, right. my French story and my wine case, which may, they're coming in a week to replace the lock. So wow. decide whether or not. What a caper. It. But it's very common to have a wine case. So this is another, I couldn't believe it. Interpol has its own wine. Wow. <laughs> which they just but I mean, um, this is my so kind of is, job, Lisa. <laughs> and it's very well priced and it's quite good. So, uh, anyway, I have to do it right now. All right. No, so, um, so that's yeah, Interpol has its own wine. And this is just a cafe on a really nice street here that on this one Saturday I was determined to live in a particular neighborhood on this street and so I set out and I went to a boulangerie to ask the boulangerie if they knew of any apartments and I bought a baguette. Then I went to the cafe to ask them if they knew any apartments and of course I had to have some bread and cheese and wine. And they told me that the chocolate shop next door controlled the building so then I had to go have some chocolate. So anyway, it's just a, when it was one of my first days here and so it's kind of a nice memory for me. And Good it's indicative of the French food. Good way to spend it. Oh, uh, this is the little the honest the gastronomic capital of the world, and this is um, a dinner that I had one evening with some friends at um, the Paul Bocuse Institute for uh, that teaches students cooking and traditional French and you know very fancy service and really beautiful food and very delicious. What's on the far right? The far right is. Uh, that was a piece, I think, of architecture and mushrooms and some kind of sauce. And then the other is a kind of infused tomato. Okay. Wow. Very fancy. This is Ancy, which is a, a little town about an hour, a couple of hours outside Lyon, and it's kind of called the, the Venice of France. And it's um, it's just lovely. Village town. One of my favorite cities, Lisa. Ah, very good. If I had a daughter, nice. that was going to be her name. Yeah, you go straight. Oh my gosh. Yes, very pretty. So that brings this trip. Gorgeous. My trip. That's, this is another village, uh, Perugia, I think it's called. Um, this is like a 30 minute train ride. It was one of my first, you know, nothing to do this weekend, just hop on the train and go someplace close. And so this is a lovely ancient village. Wonderful. 
So that's a little tour of Lisa's day-to-day -day life, which looks amazing. I'm sorry about your stolen wine. I want to hear more about what Interpol does about that at some point. I know there's going to be answers. The next uh, section of our discussion is more uh, questions pertaining to career, et cetera, and how you got to where you are. But it's fun to live a little bit of Lyon with you and wish I could get over there. Um, so first, I'd just like to start with a little bit. Of, I, I know, someday. I'd like to start with a little bit about your time at Newsel, Northeastern Law. Tell me about your co-ops and some of your favorite classes that you think maybe were relevant to your work now, or they could have just been some of your favorite classes. Sure, so my co-ops were uh, the um, Metro, uh, Legal Aid Society of Metro Denver, which was in Denver, Colorado, and that was, uh, you know, public sector and was mainly Amy Holmans and I wanted to go cross country, so we drove to do a job cross country, so we drove cross country, and uh, so that was, you know, I, I that was a great co-op, you know, got to do some very hands-on work. My second co-op was at the Southern District of New York U.S. Attorney's Office in the narcotics section, and, you know, I, I think just, you know, Northeastern, because of our co-op system where we were working, we were able to do co-ops at different times than most people were on break, uh, but then when most people could do their internships felt like, you know, both the co-op, I did a co-op at uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and then I went back three months later and did a co-op with um, SDNY uh, U.S. District Court. And both of those co-ops, I didn't feel like I, if I was competing with all the New York law schools, never would have done that co-op, those co-ops. And they were really great experiences on the U.S. Attorney one. I went back shortly after the co-op because one of the narcotics trials was going on and, and the AUSA let me sit at the council table with them. And so those two co-ops I think were really instrumental in my decision to return to New York after law school and to pursue prosecution. And my last co-op was at a private firm in Boston just to give private firm work a try and yep. definitely was not for me. So but it was really, you know, I think one of the great things about Northeastern is being able to try different co-ops that you didn't, you know, wasn't necessarily the kind of work you would think you would want to do. In classes, you know, even though I didn't like property, I loved Tom Campbell. And I think, you know, my memories are really just him lecturing and being uh, just his demeanor. And so I really liked Tom Campbell and Carl, Claire, of course, was so down to earth. And um, though I loved criminal law, thinking about it today and still think about it when I talk to people about law school that we learned criminal law via the defense and those big books that Johnson would make of legal size paper which was made up of all the defensive cases and that was how we learned criminal law but uh, I love criminal law so yeah those were some of the classes I really liked. Fun. Well, I'll be sure to share that with Carl. I don't know if he's on or not today, but I'll be sure to tell him. Um, did you study abroad in college? Yes, I did. Well, I didn't study abroad, but um, when I was an undergrad at Northeastern, I had to do a co-op and I thought that uh, Scotland Yard would be a really good place to do a co-op. And one of my professors knew someone that had been at the yard. And so uh, he suggested I write to him and I did. And he suggested I write to uh, Sir David McNee, who was the head of the commissioner of Scotland Yard, and suggest that I could be the liaison between the British and the American police, which as an undergrad was really good. not, I was not going to happen. But nonetheless, I did write to Scotland Yard many times, though they never wrote me back. I did keep meeting people. It was a shoe shiner at Samuel Hall. And I kept meeting people at the shoe shine stand who said, you should go over anyway, you'll learn about the English legal system. So I did go. And then I went down to the Inns of Court, which is where all the barristers have their chambers. And I just stopped people and said I was an American and I wanted to learn about the English legal system. And I met a solicitor and a barrister and the barrister let me go to trials with him and to spend time in chambers. And so I loved that and I spent five months there. And then when I left, I 
that's when I decided I really want to be a barrister because they wear the very cool wigs and robes. And um, but then I started to go to law school in the U.S. first, and so I came back and uh, finished college, and then took some time off, lived in Ireland for a while, wow. and then uh, back and applied to Northeastern. But I will say that when I went into Northeastern to get my application, um, I had when I was graduating from undergraduate, the Boston Globe did this article and where I had to say in the article that I hoped to go to Northeastern Law School. And when I went to get the application, somehow the women in the office and I started talking and I, they, I said something about shine, and they said, you're the shine girl. And then they went into Joan DeBron's office and came out with the article and said, we were wondering if you were going to apply. That's so, amazing. Uh, you're so uh, entrepreneurial. Uh, it's just amazing to me. Uh, you no, are. That's fun. Did you have family in law enforcement? What was the fascination uh, with, no? Did you read Nancy Drew? What? Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Sherlock yeah. Holmes. Yeah, I That's mean, you really, you really knew so young that that was your area. And the fact that you just created that in Scotland is just unbelievable to me. Incredible. Um, yeah, yeah. What did you like or not like about your ADA roles? I didn't, I, I, what I loved was uh, it was super um, hands-on. I loved the, my, the, my colleagues at the DA's office. We were all kind of in the trenches together. I loved the going out at, although I also hated it, but the going out at 4 a.m. to a, uh, you know, precinct to take in, to do interviews and um, riding across the Brooklyn Bridge, you know, at 11 o'clock at night, leaving work. And uh, I love, you know, the camaraderie of the group and the very, and working with law enforcement and just the hands-on nature of it. What I didn't, what I also, and also had a love-hate relationship with doing sex crimes cases because I loved them. I was super invested in them, but you know, I felt, per, you know, that personally it was my mission to convict the person, you know, if he had sexually abused the child. And so, but you can't control what a jury does. You can't, you don't know how the witness is going to be. And so, uh, I, though I loved those cases, I didn't, I came to not be able to do them anymore. And so, uh, sure, you know, it takes a lot out stop. of you, right? Yes, it did. Yeah. 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 So I admire people that, you know, have done them for years. They're very hard cases. And so that was a love hate relationship. Can you tell me a little bit about what your day to day is like there at Interpol? Yeah, sure. At Interpol. What you can tell. Well, uh, <laughs> so Interpol is, you know, it's made up of, of many law enforcement from, of course, around the world. But its mission is basically to promote the widest possible mutual cooperation among police authorities. So much of the work is, is not hands-on law enforcement. It's not going out and doing arrests and taking down people and uh, conducting long-term investigations. It's assisting law enforcement that are doing those things. So uh, the best way, I think, to put it is that main Interpol is kind of bread and butter and main thing are our, our databases. You know, we have databases of wanted persons. And, you know, if you've heard of a red notice or a blue notice, the red notices are kind of the most well-known. They're, you know, if there's a fugitive that's wanted by a country and you don't know where he is, and you put the red notice out for him, uh, the red notices come from Interpol and the other kinds of no other color notices. And then we have databases that are contain a lot of law enforcement information that it's helpful for law enforcement around the world because they have only information from there. So at, in my section, we review all the projects that the various sections want to initiate uh, or databases want to correct. And we advise on the lawfulness of them. And it's a lot of um, data protection work, which I had never worked in. So um, that's kind of new. Wow, and um, describe how you work with multiple organizations such as the State Department. How would you interact with them? So at Interpol, I don't, but at my job at um, the Office of International Affairs, we interacted with the State Department because diplomatic, they are the diplomatic channel for the US. So if there was um, a, uh, 
um, you know, an extradition request come through diplomatic channels, so we would receive them from the State Department, and then we would work with very closely with the U.S. Marshals because they would do all the transits for the fugitives uh, and look for them uh, and do the arrests, and uh, and work with you know FBI and DEA and and the <coughs> sorry Department of Homeland Security uh, because a lot of the cases that the U.S. cases were you know uh, conducted if they were federal cases they were being investigated by those agencies and. And we would work with the U.S. Attorney's Office on the extradition and um, mutual assistance requests. And then we would also work with uh, all the foreign law enforcement agencies and the central authorities for the foreign countries. And it was when I started working at OIA, you know, I felt, I realized, wow, you know, the international work is really terrific. It's great. Is it like in the movies where there's, um, like spies that you're going after and things along those lines. One of my um, colleagues wanted me to ask you like that. Is it like how it's routinely portrayed as like a swashbuckling group of international globe trotting special agents um, <laughs> with universal jurisdiction or is it much more tempered and um, constructed, yeah. I guess. Now I wish it was like the movies, <laughs> but it's not. Uh, it's very, you know, because they are not operational. So uh, unfortunately for, for them and us, not for us, but in touch, unfortunately, because they are primarily made up of law enforcement from all over the world that are very used to being that, you know, operational and going out and conducting the arrests and the takedowns. And so Interpol is not that way. So. Uh, yeah, all the articles about Interpol arrests, Interpol takes down, is, Interpol is not doing those arrests or not those takedowns, facilitating them. What do you wish you knew before you had gone to Lyon? Um, you know, I think that maybe that I read up a little bit more on Lyon. I would, you know, I, I was so busy getting ready to move and packing up and all that, that I didn't really have any time to research here. So, so that, and just, you know, that you would want to know the country that you're going to a little bit before you go. Perhaps because once you get here, you're super busy and you're not, you're not you don't have a lot of time to do a lot of, of looking up. But, you know, I think um, it came along at the right time and, and it's a really, you know, France is a nice country to live in. It wasn't like it wasn't like I was going to a uh, a remote area where I wouldn't have support or be able to make a phone call. Those kinds of positions are, I think, much would be much more difficult to settle into. So, you know, you have to get all your paperwork together and all that, and medical, and uh, and take care of your if you have a place in the U.S. Yeah, there's a lot to do before you go. Um, but yeah, someone you, asked if you learned French. Like, did you try? Uh, no, I, I knew I knew a little French from high school. Um, and Google Translate is amazing because now I will have my neighbor speak into the phone and then I can see what he's saying. But no, like it's another thing I would like to take some French lessons. You know, it, it would be helpful to have it at least in Lyon, there's enough people that speak a little English and I speak a little French. And so, but it would be good to have it, but I, and I only studied it in high school, but not. Yes. Since um, if you had to speak about trade and geopolitical tensions between the US and other countries um, under the current administration and perhaps under the last administration, has that impacted your work? Um, have you noticed no, no, I mean, for me, not at all, because Interpol, because first I represent Interpol, second, Interpol is very a neutral country, you know, they're, they don't embark in anything political, racial, um, religious, you know, they don't, they don't make, they really don't make political statements, and I am a representative of Interpol, so they, I, I don't really feel the, 
the geopolitical, you know, uh, risk that there might have been or situation as it is now. So, well, that's good to hear. If a grad was considering making a move to an international location, what would be a good checklist for them to think about? First, I would say do it because it's a great experience and uh, checklist, you know, the general checklist of what you need to put together, but to look into the country and read about the country. It doesn't sound like someplace you'd want to live. What's the housing like? And believe what you read, I think, because, because you read something and you might think, oh, it would be different for me, or I won't have trouble finding a place to live. And But if you read up on a country and you keep seeing it says, you know, it's hard to find an apartment, you should believe it. And you just read up on the country and, and the, the people in the country and think, is it, you know, is this a place I want to live? If you have a family, it will affect, of course, you'll, you, you'll be the working, you'll be working, but if you have kids, affect the kids, then Know, affect your family that it's some place that everybody could live this is a three-year assignment so yes a three-year assignment and uh yeah sometimes i walk around and think i'm never leaving here yeah so why I'm not uh, do you do you okay. see yourself coming back to washington dc yes i think so probably i think so at the moment, no, I have a condo there, so. Yep. Well, I wanted yeah. to open it up for questions from other people, but is there any, is there anything else before we do that that you wanna share with our audience today and for people thinking about, you know, what is this type of work like? No, I mean, I, I just think, I think that uh, I would just say, it's, it could, I could never have planned it. And so I, I feel very fortunate that in my career, I, I was always doing something I loved and I was fortunate that something else kind of cropped up for a little bit and then I was flexible. I was able to be flexible enough to, you know, go to DC for a year and then flexible to be able to go to, to Phoenix and none of that would have been anything I would ever have scripted. Right. So I would say, you know, that. But I've loved it all. I, it was what I wanted to do was to be a criminal prosecutor, and I was able to do that in a lot of different ways. And so, I, you know, I was fortunate that I was able to be flexible, and I couldn't have, even though 40 years ago I wanted to work at Interpol, would never, if I had really just honed in on that, I don't know if that would have happened. But the way it happened, you know, yeah. uh, was a good natural circle. And so I think, you know, just if you know what you want and you follow that and be flexible. Flexibility is king. Do you still have that letter? Oh my God, I looked all over for that letter and yeah. I couldn't find it. And, uh, yeah. She's fun to have so on I found your wall. Yeah, I, I would totally have it on my That would be fun. So we do have a couple questions already. I see Pamela Talbot. Do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, Pam. Hey, hey Lisa. Hi, Annie. How are Hi. you? It's so good to, really see you. good to see you. You'll be sorry that so you saw my face because I'm so coming to visit. Um, but <laughs> I had a question for you. I know that Interpol does a lot of extradition and rendition. I did some of that when I was at the AG's office and usually it's pretty rough, but sometimes you get a real, like something that's the facts are just unbelievable. And I'm just wondering what is the most kind of facts are stranger than fiction extradition or rendition that you've had to do? So thanks so much. For a great question. So Interpol only puts out the red notices and the cases come from the district. So, but I could say that one of the fastest stranger than fiction uh, cases that I worked on at the U.S. Attorney's at the Office of International Affairs was it, there was, and was a case where a, a guy was, uh, you know, pretending to be a 16 year old guy, boy, communicating with a girl in Virginia. And once he, you know, got her to take one kind of sexual picture, he sextorted her for almost a year, made her sleep with the iPod, iPad at her bed and do all these other, you know, horrible things. And then um, finally she told her parents and they went to the police and then through work with Canada, they located the guy in Canada. And 
Um, and then we worked on, you know, we were going to arrest him like one particular week. And then over the weekend, he was threatening them. So boom, that night, uh, you know, working on a, an arrest request and a request for a search and then putting, serving it on, giving it to Canada, waiting for them to go in and uh, take and arrest him. And finally they did that next day. And there he was, you know, on the second floor, 60 year old guy with a wife and two kids and oh you know the big, which just some you know the room of another girl and they found 62 other you know names of girls he was communicating wow. with all of them and threatening them and they were saying I'm gonna commit suicide he didn't care so they arrested him and you know we, we extradited him to uh Detroit and and he pled guilty, and I went to Detroit to watch the sentencing because I was so involved in the case, and he got 30 years. And so, I mean, just the things that people do, you know, the frauds that people do, the murders that people do, you know, chopping up bodies and throwing them in the river, it's all, I would say, work at the Office of International Affairs. A lot of it was, you just can't make up what people do. Mm -hmm. That's a really good one. I'm glad you got him. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Well, I hope you go visit Pamela. Amy, you had a question? Yes. Hi, I don't have, hey, Lise. I don't have so much a question as I just want to say that Lisa is incredibly humble in how she describes her career. And having known Lisa <laughs> for, well, she's in the class behind me in Northeastern, but I've known her since she was a first year student. Um, Lisa has had the, the most emotionally taxing, stressful assignments um, throughout her career. I mean, I, I mean, at times I like really worried about her um, because of the nature of the work. First, it was the child sex abuse in the, in the, AD, in the DA's office. It was cyber sexploitation. It was and it was, and then, and, and when she moved into national affairs, you know, the, 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 just the stress and the immediacy of the work that was being done and the volume of it. And for those people who think that, that, you know, being, being the su support um, for, you know, all these criminal agencies that the Department of International Affairs is for is somehow easy public service. Um, and I, they've not, spend much time with Lisa because the hours that Lisa has worked over her career would be the hours of a normal person's about about three people's individual careers um and that Lisa's globe trotted for you know for decades um you know personally but also professionally in Department of National Affairs she didn't land in Interpol as a matter of luck um, that this was all just a result of a lot of hard work and frankly there aren't a lot of people who would take this job that Lisa's in now at the end of their career. Um, this is a job that people would take, you know, at 35 because you've got all the gas and Lisa's up for this kind of, of adventure. And I think it says a lot about Lisa and she would never say it for herself. So I am going to say it, that she has just been extraordinary. And I love you and I can't wait to see you in person. And she looks 35. So <laughs> She's always looked just exactly like this, except she had really short hair at Northeastern, little bob. Thanks, Amy. Does anybody else have a question? I, I have something. Am I, is my audio working? Mark, you're on. Lisa, we missed you. And we missed so many, Pam, every face on this call, I'm teary-eyed and full of goosebumps seeing you because we so missed you at our wonderful five-year gathering. The Zoom call was okay, but not like a hug in the flesh. And Lisa, I owe you a big, long, hard hug. So good to see you. I want to echo Amy's beautiful comments that <clears throat> Lisa is one of the most genuine, heartfelt, heart-driven, good people you'll ever meet. And She's the last person you would expect to be engaging in the kind of really tough, difficult, Work. emotionally charged, and at times 
really depressing work that she does. And she just does it with a, a joie de vivre. That's as much French as I'm gonna to mention today, but like you're it. an amazing person and your networking capabilities are par excellence. I mean, like nobody else's. Everything you have accomplished, I think in your life. Uh oh, did I cause her to leave? I hope not. From shoeshine girl to... I mean, it's just, it's just who she is. She makes things happen in a calm, loving, just genuine way. Um, and to know her is to love her. I agree. I mean, might have, we might have lost Lisa, our <clears throat> international uh, connection. I, I, would, I, I, I would add Mark to what Mark just said. Stephen Linsky, I, I can't find where to raise my hand here. It's not, it's not okay. showing. Well, hold on. Wait till Lisa comes back. Well, I think she's, she may be there, Mark. She's just turned her um, video off, maybe. Lisa, you there? Lisa, well, are you still, there? You're still being recorded. So we'll yeah. finish up with Stephen oh, and then. By, by Interpol. Probably. <laughs> No, what I was just, what I was going to say, what what Mark said in terms of, you know, a person that, that you mean, I would not know, and I, I did not. I'll speak for myself. I did not know the backstory here, so that's what I kind of learned. I had no idea that Lisa kind of came to Northeastern with this interest, so I knew nothing about it. So every five years when we would gather and I would catch what she was doing, I said, really, because she just seems to me like I wouldn't guess that of her. It's pretty amazing. Now, the, my, my question part is this, and I think I kind of know the answer, but it was but with, the, with the stealing of the wine that kind of got me back into that, into that thing, which is, so you've worked on, you know, you've worked on this side, on the police side, and now you're dealing with international characters, et cetera. You don't seem to be at fear of your safety or anything like that, but I take it that you, you are in contact with kind of organized groups and they know about you. I'm just, I'm just curious, uh, you know, the extent to which you kind of interact with what I would call a more uh, organized criminal um, organizations. Lisa, if you, uh, it sounds like you can still hear us. If you wanted to put something in the chat, even you could, if we can't get your photo or voice again, but um, are you afraid for your- You're muted, you're muted, Lisa. She's on her phone. Can you hear okay, me now? now? Yes. Yeah, now, yeah. Okay. Now. Are you afraid for your safety, Lisa? No, no. Because I'll come Cause... right over. <laughs> <laughs> come on over. Whoa. Yeah. Well, that's no. good to hear because it does sound like you could be afraid of some of the criminals you've put away. No, you know, I think I've, uh, I'm just, I'm separated enough from the whole situation, but now that I, I really want to thank Mark and uh, Amy and Steve for those really amazing comments. I am teary eyed and I really miss everyone. And it's so good to, to see everyone on Zoom, but you're right, Mark, I would love to have been at that five year reunion and uh, so good to see everyone in the pictures looking totally the same. And it just makes me remember the great times that our class had and how great we were, our class it was and Amy's class and how much fun we had. And uh, yeah, so Leon is here for all of you. Yeah. <laughs> I wanna, Does I anybody say, have a final question? Sure. Yeah, Cheryl, can I say okay. something? Okay. Yeah. Lisa, yes. we're so proud of you. You are the best of us, the best women and about you that's so amazing to me that you're so sweet and so genuine and such a good friend and such a good person you are sort of this kick-ass mf prosecutor that is out there changing the world and it's bad. you know i've said this before that we all write in our lawyer application we want to become a lawyer to change the world you know what and you became a lawyer and you're changing the world. And, and I'm so proud to know you. Thank you for everything and thank you for- No, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you so much. And I know your story and I know how much you've done and I know how much Mark and Amy and everyone in, that has done and the folks in our class. And I just think and Northeastern turns out 
totally amazing attorneys who were have been amazing people. So, you know, I, I came from a good base. Thank you so much. I'm going to agree. We had a comment yeah. from Professor Rose Ziltik Zix. She said, what a wonderful session and yay for ethical and vigorous prosecutors. Debbie Ramirez and I brought a prosecutor's eye to 1L Crim just after you finished law school, but John Flynn was an amazing professor who had such a profound effect on a whole generation of Nuzzle lawyers. So just wanted to share that with you from Professor Rose Zoltekjik. I think we're going to wrap it up, but Lisa, I agree with all of the comments. I mean, I read your bio. I learned a little bit more about you through this process, through our slideshow fund, through just hearing about um, everything from shoeshine Lisa to you thought in college you wanted to work at Interpol and now you are. So it's fun to hear the stories behind the story. And we're just really proud of all the good work you're doing internationally. And it's proud. Uh, it's a proud moment to kind of highlight your work today. Yeah, thank you so much. I am very honored to be on and uh, very proud to have gone to Northeastern and uh, feel very fortunate and I miss my class and Amy, so uh, Lisa. I, well, you'll hmm? be you'll be back at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I thank nice. everyone for coming in, chiming in. Thank you. Um, Soli says he loves you, Dave Sullivan. Well, I love you, Dave, my chimney sweet friend. You're the reason I got into Northeastern. Yeah. Thank you. You didn't mention that, huh? I kind of get totally. all right in with you. They needed a chimney sweep after a uh, shoe shiner. So. Totally, totally. You're, yeah. you're my yeah. girl. These are fun stories. Dave you don't Wilson, know where you're going to land, Lisa. You know? Dave Wilson hey. says, thanks for sharing your story. So inspiring. Thanks, uh, Dave. Lisa, Thank you. it'll always be Leon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> you might just see me soon, you know, once COVID's over. <laughs> Come on over. All right. All right, Lisa. We raise our glasses to you. Thanks, There's just water okay. over Thanks here. Thanks so much, everyone, for so taking the water, time to be in. You Thank you for the time. So good to see you. Au revoir. Au bientôt. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Cheers. Au revoir. Au revoir. Merci beaucoup for coming. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Merci beaucoup. Bye.